Oh, it's already out of hospital again. Uh, good morning, everyone. So good to see you after uh, the weekend. Uh, yeah, we missed you, Erin, on uh, the last two classes. Sorry to hear about your uh, uncle, but we'll be praying for him. So please pray for Erin's uh, uh, uncle. Uh, he's diagnosed with uh, cancer. Pray for him. But if you missed, uh, since you missed those classes, you know the... Uh, lecture videos are posted on the stream page and you can take so this is the last class on uh, children's ministry i hope you um, uh, read uh, pastor roshan's uh, uh, note which he's put on the stream page uh, he says that uh, you know he's supposed to take classes from tomorrow uh, youth ministry so he says uh, um, tomorrow that he will not have the bc313 class uh, youth ministry tomorrow uh, we'll meet only the following week, that is on March 8th and 9th. Okay, so you won't have class tomorrow. But in case I'm not able to finish my, um, you know, portion today, then I can take it tomorrow because anyway, he's not, uh, he'll not be taking a class. Okay, so let's begin. We were basically looking at how to write a lesson plan. Uh, we looked at the introduction and in the introduction, we looked uh, at how uh, you know we can make it more creative, get the attention of the children, uh, catch their attention, uh, you know, uh, uh, connect to them to their felt needs. So we can do uh, have an attention getter, or we can do object lessons. And then we talked about um, uh, you know the main teaching content. We said keep the language simple. So it's important to write your lesson plan. So when we are writing, you know, uh, if we see any difficult words, like, uh, you know, which might uh, might sound very simple for us, like words like jealousy, loose living, Pharaoh, uh, you know, uh, Joseph and the Pharaoh that he served under, famine, uh, plague, beatitudes, uh, you know, or you say, you know, the serpent spoke to Eve. Uh, the children will be wondering, how can a serpent or a snake speak to Eve? Uh, so then when you look at all of this, you know, you can pause, you can think how you can simplify it, how you can help them understand, uh, you know, and it's important that you uh, replace these terms or these words with uh, easier words so that you can explain it to them. Uh, otherwise, we'll end up speaking to like... Uh, like we're speaking to adults and children will be totally lost and confused and we'll see them uh, not interested. And you'll be wondering, I have taken so much of time and effort to prepare. I've done so many object lessons, attention getter, but these children don't seem to listen because we're not able to connect with them because we're basically speaking to like we're speaking to another adult. But we need to remember that we're speaking to children and we need to get down to their level, speak in their language um, that they can best understand. We also said uh, Christian jargons, you know, um, like righteousness, uh, uh, redemption, um, uh, we are sanctified, we are all sinners, saved in the blood of Jesus, uh, the sinless blood of uh, Jesus, the sinless Lamb of God, uh, you know, we are saved by grace through faith. Uh, the blood of Jesus can, uh, cleanses us. You know, God made a covenant with us, the new covenant, old covenant. Now they won't even know what covenant means. Leave alone what is the old covenant, what is the new covenant. And you as, uh, you know, Bible college student, excited, you're learning all this, you want to share it with them, but they will not understand. So it's important when you're writing, when you come across all of these terms, how are you going to explain it? How are you going to uh, get them to understand so you can, uh, you know, write them all down? Or you're talking about Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table, Communion. They're wondering all uh, what's the Lord's Table all about. So, um, you know, um, write it down so that you can explain these terms. And remember that when you're explaining, uh, you cannot explain a concept or a word the same way you explain to an eighth standard or a ninth grader or a tenth grader, like you would explain to a child in second grade or third grade. Uh, so that also you need to understand and how you're going to simplify it and how you're going to help them to understand. Okay. Have them understand. Now, um, 
the next important thing is when you're writing the main content in your lesson is uh, that our goal as children's church ministers or Sunday school teachers is not just to narrate a story. I've already said this before, but it's to uh, bring about deeper truths or deeper theology from God's word. Uh, I've already given you a couple of examples, but I'll just give you one or two here and move on. Now, basically, when you're talking about creation, when you said, you know, um, you know, God created everything, uh, he, he said, and it was there. He said, let there be light. There was light. He said, let the waters above separate from the waters below, and it just separated. So the children can say, okay, you know, he's God. He can do anything that he wants. But you can teach them that God's word is powerful. How did God create everything? created he said through his words so god's words are powerful when god speaks something god declares something you know it'll come about it's truth it will happen it will come into existence we will see it then you can talk to them about uh, the promises in god's word how they can you know declare god's word speak god's word and the importance of them learning the memory verse uh, so when they speak the memory verse, you know, they will see God working, they will see miracles happening that God does in their life because of the spoken word. Or when you're talking about creation, we're saying God created man in his likeness, in his image, then uh, children are thinking, okay, we are just like God, but God has no form or shape, he's a spirit being. So what does it really mean that he's created us in his image and likeness? It just basically means that God is holy. He created us holy. God does not die. He created us to, you know, that we also should not die. He, God is sinless. He created us sinless. God has a mind. He thinks. He gave us a mind so that we can think, understand what he's saying, perceive him. You no, know, God has a uh, will. He does what he uh, wills. He chooses. He gave us the uh, a will to choose. Uh, you know, God has a heart. Uh, that's why he's able to communicate and love and fellowship with us. He gave us our hearts so that we can in turn communicate and fellowship with God. So that is the meaning of created in Christ's image and likeness. So very basic things, but we need to explain it to them. Now, for example, if you're talking about uh, Bartimaeus' um, narrative and you're saying, you know, uh, Jesus said, uh, Bartimaeus, your faith has healed you. You know, so you can say, how did Bartimaeus faith has healed? So children will be basically understanding that, you know, when they take medicines or they go to the doctor or get an uh, injection, you know, they'll be healed. Um, or where they rest, they he get healed. But how can faith heal us? So you can say, you know, Bartimaeus is blind. He's never seen Jesus do any healing. Uh, he's uh, never just heard the name of Jesus now because he's come to his town. He's just heard that, you know, Jesus heals. And uh, he's never seen, so it's he's not seen, but still he believes. That is faith. We don't see God, but we still believe that he's there. He's there to help us. He's there to heal us. And uh, his faith never, uh, you know, uh, gave up. You know, nobody was willing to take Bartimaeus to Jesus. There was no uh, way he could go to Jesus because he could not see where Jesus was. There's a big crowd, but he does not give up. You know, his faith does not give up. He presses it. He shouts. He screams. He does everything possible till he gets his healing. And say, so faith is that. Faith is, you know, we don't see God, but we believe. We don't. We know that God heals us, but we keep pressing in till we receive our healing. Okay. Uh, or take for example, um, you know, David. You know, when David went to fight Goliath. Uh, he says, you come to me with your sword and spear and javelin. First, uh, Samuel chapter 17, verse 45. But David says, I come to you in the name of the Lord God Almighty, the God of armies of Israel, whom you have defeated. Now we can continue with the story on what David did and how Goliath fell and how he took his sword and cut off his neck. And hooray, you know, the battle is won. David becomes a hero. But we missed out something important. He says, I come to you in the, come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. So you can stop and talk about how powerful the name of the Lord God Almighty is. That when Jesus died, he resurrected, you know, uh, God the Father says his name will be the highest name, the highest name in heaven and earth and no other name than the name of Jesus. And every knee and every tongue will worship, bow down and worship and glorify 
uh, this great name that is Jesus' name, and Jesus' name has the power to heal. So when we speak in Jesus' name, that is why we pray and say amen in Jesus' name. Or when we, when we pray for healing for people, we can pray in Jesus' name for healing for them. Uh, so you can talk about the power that is there in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus, the demons shudder and shiver and run. Uh, so the power that is there in the name of Jesus, and Jesus has given us the power and the authority uh, to use that name to bring about healing, to save people, uh, you know, to deliver ourselves from uh, sicknesses and demonic bondages. So the power that is there in the name of Jesus. So uh, these are small things that you can just bring about theological truths that you can read, you can speak to them, teach them. And so you're just giving them at a very young age, teaching them all of these deep uh, uh, truths rather than just telling the narrative and leaving it as uh, that, you know, they would have enjoyed the story, but they wouldn't have not learned anything much about the nature of God, who he is and what he does. Okay. Uh, the fifth thing that we need to um, remember is, you know, I've already spoken about the next few points that I'm going to share is, uh, you know, make the sessions interactive. So when you're writing the main content, uh, you know, when you can bring in an object lesson, when you can, uh, you know, uh, show them some pictures, uh, visuals like uh, pictures, posters, uh, puppets, you can even use final graphs. I've spoken about all of these things. Uh, these are important because, uh, you know, research has, uh, research shows us that, uh, you know, uh, children uh, retain 10% of only what they hear. So when you're only teaching children uh, by just speaking like I'm doing now, uh, they retain only 10% of what they hear. But if you're showing them some pictures or some PowerPoints or a movie or something uh, or a final graph or puppet or object lesson, they retain 30%. Uh, they remember 30% of what you have taught. But if you, uh, you know, show, speak to them and also show them their hearing and seeing, then 50% of the learning takes place. So 50% takes place when they hear and see. 70% uh, you know, of the learning happens when they not only hear, see, but they also say. That means you ask them questions uh, to understand whether they have understood uh, or know for yourself whether they have understood what you have explained to them. So when you're writing the lesson plan in between, you can just put a simple question, uh, you know, um, uh, to just understand what they have uh, 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 caught or whether they have uh, understood what you have uh, taught them thus far. So just one or two questions in between to get their attention, to catch their attention, to know if they've uh, heard right, listened right, they've received it right. Uh, so they learn 70% when they hear, see and say, you involve them, involve them, you know, ask them questions, ask them what they think about this verse, ask them how did David uh, uh, was able to kill uh, Goliath or why did David go to fight Goliath when nobody other soldiers were not when he was just a shepherd boy so just get them thinking okay 70% happens when they hear see and say 90% happens when they hear see say and do so it's important for you to get them to do things uh, activities involve them in the attention getter involve them in the object lesson uh, so the next point is get children involved. Uh, so no matter how hard you plan an interesting and exciting lesson, most young ones will become bored if you do all the talking. So it's as we've already learned in the developmental needs, it's important that you have class activities, uh, you participate the children, get them into discussions, group discussions, uh, you know, um, and uh, get them uh, involved in the learning that happens. And when there's participatory learning, there's more enthusiasm uh, and children learn better. Okay. And uh, like I already said, you know, uh, don't just give out all the information and, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, decide for yourself that children have understood. It is an exciting, exciting class. I did activities, object lessons. I gave them, a, you know, all of these things. Uh, so it's a good class. I showed them pictures. Important to get their feedback as well. So, you know, just pop up one or two questions uh, while you're teaching uh, to gather what they have understood 
and if they have not really clearly understood you can explain it again to them so you now you know why it takes uh, four times the you know the length of the preparation time if we are uh, uh, four times the length of your uh, class time if you're teaching 30 minutes you know you have to at least prepare for two hours and that's this is all that goes in while preparing your um, lesson and I also mentioned that once you prepare your lesson plan and you notice it's too big you want to break it down you want to divide it so you decide where you stop where you bring the conclusion uh, what is the application you will bring in uh, and where you will continue from the next class and how can children practice what they have learned okay now before we close we look at um, how to narrate a bible story okay um now we know that uh, every uh, all the children love bible stories you know as adults we too love stories so it's very important to capture their attention uh, uh, in the story uh, so it's good that you um, you know are able to narrate the events and actions well so for that we'll just um, uh, look at the various ways to uh, you know, narrate a, a story. Let me just uh, put up the PowerPoints. Uh, for, for narrating the story, I'll just be looking at, um, you know, uh, Naboth and the um, uh, you know, King Ahab wanting Naboth's vineyard in First Kings chapter uh, 21. I don't know if you are familiar with this um, uh, with this narrative in the Bible. Okay. Let me just present this slide to you. So we look at uh, First Kings chapter twenty-one. Okay. Okay. So um, when you're narrating a story, what are the things to keep in mind? First thing is uh, the beginning. Uh, you know, it's important to begin a narrative or a story well. Once you begin it well, half of your job is uh, done. Uh, it's the best place to capture their attention and the worst place that you can also lose their attention. Uh, you know, if you don't get the children's attention in the beginning, you will you cannot teach them anything. Um, be careful not to give away the secret of your story right in the beginning. For example, like I mentioned uh, early in, in the previous class, uh, don't ever say today we are going to hear about a man called Jonah who was swallowed by a big fish. Okay, now you've completed telling the story in 17 words when you've not yet started telling the whole narrative, but children will, most of the children know Jonah's story. So they say, oh, we know Jonah's story. It's so boring and they'll not be interested in learning. So don't give away who the main characters are, who this narrative is about. Just keep them guessing uh, and, uh, you know, keep them uh, uh, so that they can keep listening to what you are saying okay and also avoid introductions like uh, okay now sit up fold up your hands fold your arms you know i'm going to tell you a story <coughs> sorry i'm sure you've heard this story before or you can say today i'm going to uh, tell you a story about uh, uh, king ahab and how he wanted to get Naboth's vineyard and um, you know you'll have a problem if you know if you say you know, uh, I'm sure you've heard the story before. So the children will say, okay, ma'am, which story? Then you say David and Goliath or Zacchaeus. I know that story. Ma'am, can we play? Can we, you know, can you tell us some other story? So best not to give away all the details. Also, don't give away the entire story. Today, I'm going to tell you about King Ahab who wanted Naboth's vineyard. And so the children will say, I'm not interested in any king's story. It's so boring. Uh, you know, what is a vineyard? I'm not interested. Um, so there's four way, uh, main ways of beginning a story. Um, uh, but if you, you know, kind of discover 
more effective ways uh, of uh, beginning a story, don't hesitate to use it. Uh, we'll basically be looking at First Kings chapter 21 about uh, uh, King Nahab wanting Naboth's vineyard. Okay, so you can begin your story in one of these ways. The first one is a direct approach. Um, you can start with the action of the story. So you can think of several sentences which will capture the attention of the children. So you can start the story by somewhere in the middle of the narrative that is there, uh, that's there in the Bible. You can say, you know, this was just a vineyard. Uh, children, you know what's the meaning of a vineyard? So you can explain to them what a vineyard is. And you can say, you know, there was a king who wanted this vineyard. Okay. And uh, why did he want this vineyard? Uh, didn't it belong to him? Now he's a king, he, you know, he owns the entire land. But this vineyard was right beside his uh, summer palace. Summer palace is, you know, you can explain what the summer palace is. And then you can say the king thought about it and thought about it. Uh, but you see, he had a big problem. Now the children be wondering, what's the problem? You know, kings own everything. They have everything. Um, and then you can say, you know, the vineyard did not belong to him. Okay. So then the children be wondering, who did it belong to? Uh, did the king really get the vineyard? Did this person give the vineyard? What did he do to get the vineyard? So, you know, it's a direct approach where you start, um, uh, you know, narrating from an interesting part in the story. Um, and if you're telling a story which the children are very familiar with, you don't want to give away the main characters, who's the king, who's vineyard, and all of those things. And then if you tell them in the beginning of the story, then they will say, oh, we know the story, ma'am, you know, he did this, he did that. And they'll start talking with their friends and you will have uh, a difficulty in handling them. Okay. So the second way we can start a story is a question approach. You can ask a question related to the narrative. Um, in this case, uh, one of the questions you can raise is, you know, uh, the question should be basically something that the children will identify with, something that concerns them, something that will catch their attention, something that will connect them to the topic. So even if you're preaching, you can use one of these uh, approaches as well. Okay, um, uh, so you can say, is there something that you really like, that you really want? Now, all of us really like something, we really want something. Uh, and I'm sure children will really, you know, uh, have so many things to share what they really like, they really want. So, you know, um, you'll have to control uh, them because they'll have so many things to say. Then you can say, you know, in today's story, there is um, there's a king. Uh, you know, he was a king, so he had everything, but there is something that he really wanted. Do you know what he really wanted? And so the kids will really be exciting because you've connected it to what their felt need is, what they are interested in. They also want something. Um, they're trying to get it and they also want to know what this king really wants and did he really get it. The third way is you can, uh, you know, start with an exciting part of the story, like a flashback approach. You can begin with an outstanding part of the narrative and then go back um, to, you know, begin and tell them the entire uh, story. So you can start this uh, uh, with an exciting part of the story. You can say, you know, this person had lots and lots of money. He had a uh, you know, lived in a big uh, house. He had a lot of servants, lovely food. He had the best house in the in the land. Um, and uh, who is this person you think who has a lot of servants, lives in the biggest house, has the best, lot of money, lot of riches? You know, yes, he was a king. So you know, you expect kings to be happy because they have everything. Uh, they don't have to do anything, uh, you know, they have the best food, they enjoy everything, they don't have to eat the same kind of food the whole week, you know, uh, but you'll expect this king to be really happy. But our king in today's story was not happy. He was very, very sad. He was in his bed sulking. He was not eating. His servants were very sad and upset. They too were uh, sulking. They too were sad because when the, when the king is happy, everyone should be happy. When the king is sad, everyone is sad. So what went wrong? Why is he sulking? Why is he sleeping on his bed? Why is he not talking to anybody? Why is he so angry? Why is he not eating? Uh, I'll tell you what happened and then you can start narrating the whole story. Okay. 
You can also begin a story by an illustration. Now, if you want to use an illustration, you need to make sure the illustration is very short and sweet because you have a story to tell, you have a lesson to complete, you have uh, application, conclusion, and all of those things. So keep the illustration very, very uh, short. So for an illustration, you can use, it depends on the age group. Now, suppose you're teaching two-year-old or three-year-old. If it's uh, most of them are boys or girls, you can also mix it up. You can say, you know, uh, Joe and uh, Sam, you know, um, uh, went out to play and Sam got a new bat. It was the latest expensive bat or a new PlayStation, whatever. And Joe was so excited. He kept looking at it and kept looking at it and holding it and looking at it and playing with it. And he thought hundred times to himself, you know, I wish I could have that. Or if it to mentioning girls, you can just say, you know, the two girls, they're good friends, they were neighbors. Um, one was, um, uh, 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 you know, Simran, one was uh, Kiran, you can just say Kiran, you know, and uh, we're both playing and uh, Kiran had a new doll and, uh, you know, it was the latest Barbie doll or the latest doll that had come out in the market. Her parents bought it for her and Simran just played with it all the time, held on to it. But when she had to go back home, she had to give back the doll to Kiran. She was very sad. And when she walked home and all the time she was playing with the doll, she just thought, you know, I wish I could have this doll or I wish I could have one just like this. And, um, you know, um, uh, so how many of you really wish you had something that somebody else had? So you're connecting with the children or if it's, you know, older children, you can connect it to, with something that uh, um, that really gets their attention. And then you can say, you know, in today's story or today's, uh, the, you know, there was a king who had everything, but there's something that he wanted so badly that belonged to somebody else and then you can start narrating the whole story okay so this is uh, the different ways that you can begin a story a, a direct approach a question exciting part of the story uh, in an illustration or you can even use an object um, lesson i've already spoken about object lesson you can use the objects and you can connect the object to the story and to the uh, learning okay now, uh, it's important that, you know, when you're narrating the story, sometimes we can be so familiar with the story, we don't want to read it from the Bible, but then we miss out the whole uh, line of thought, you know, we missed out on some point and then we go back and say, okay, missed out on this children before, you know, before uh, 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 or you if you're talking about uh, David's story, you know, before David went to meet Goliath, did you know why David came to uh, the battlefield when he was just a shepherd boy? Now, it's easier for us as older people to connect, but it's very difficult for children. So that is why when you're writing the lesson plan, you have to write the you know, the progression of events. So in our lesson today about Ahab, you know, we have to talk about how Nahab, Ahab, uh, King Ahab covets Naboth's vineyard. Then Ahab asks Naboth for it. Naboth refuses sale or exchange. Then we see that Ahab sulks. Then Jezebel comes and intervenes. Uh, and then Jezebel writes letters. Naboth is killed. And uh, Ahab goes and takes the vineyard. Then he meets uh, Elijah. And, uh, you know, Elijah tells him what he has done and how he has sinned against God. And, um, you know, what is the punishment? Okay. So here we see that, you know, uh, the, the progression of events is clearly listed out. So when you just keep looking at the points, you know what to say next. You don't miss out anything. So you don't have to go back and forth and confuse the children. There's clarity and there's a clean flow or neat flow of the story that is happening. Okay, so once you finish with the beginning, once you finish with the progression of events, the next thing is a climax and after that comes the conclusion. Now is climax and conclusion the same thing? Is climax and conclusion the same thing? Yes, no, can I have some answers?
Well, climax and confusion is not the same thing. I hope all of you are in class and you are following what I'm saying. Uh, okay, climax and conclusion is not the same thing. Uh, climax is basically the high point of the uh, story. Uh, uh, it's it's basically leading all the events that you have narrated so far. It's leading to uh, the climax. So the other events, what has it led up to? So that is the climax. It's you know where the hero wins, or it's where the problem is solved, or where the mystery ends. So in the climax of the story in Naboth's vineyard could be that you know Elijah's warning from the Lord. Uh, what God has warned Elijah, uh, or what God is um, uh, warning uh, King Ahab, and what is he speaking through the prophet Elijah? So, uh, and what is uh, the consequences of his sin? That Elijah goes and tells him uh, what God has uh, uh, has told him or revealed to him, and uh, here it is. The climax here is you know Naboth is going to uh, because Naboth was killed. Uh, and Ahab killed Naboth, so uh, God pronounces this judgment on him or this punishment on him through uh, the prophet Elijah that King Ahab is also going to die. Okay, so that is the climax of the story. Now, in some stories, we'll have several climaxes, uh, so it's important that you, uh, you know, bring the one that is closest to the truth that you're teaching. Remember, I said learning objectives. In the learning objectives, you will have one main truth, uh, one main truth that runs throughout the lesson. So you choose the climax that best fits, uh, you know, your learning objective or what is the main truth so um you know some stories might be very long you'll have to break it for two classes so then you can find one climax that fits for uh, class one and the second climax for lesson two in the same narrative so it's basically in this uh, in this narrative about king ahab is that he killed naboth or he got naboth killed or he had naboth killed and so god pronounces the judgment that um that he too will die. Now, the conclusion is, you know, did Naboth die? What happened to Naboth? Did what God, uh, you know, the judgment that God pronounced on him, did it come to pass? So that is the uh, conclusion. Okay, so the conclusion comes immediately after the climax. Um, you know, um, so it's important that you conclude the story and tell them what actually happened. Yes, Naboth was killed. Ah King Ahab got the vineyard. But did it happen just like God said or spoke through the prophet Elijah? So uh, the conclusion in uh, in King Ahab's story is that what happened to Naboth, uh, sorry, what happened to Ahab and the queen, wicked queen Jezebel. So we see that, uh, so we need to tell the children that Ahab went to fight in a battle and he disguised himself um, uh, uh, you know, not he disguised himself and he did not look like a king so that he could, uh, you know, he could save himself from the enemy. Uh, and the enemy will not know that he was the king, but he was struck by an arrow and he died. Okay. And we see that Queen Jezebel was thrown down by the enemies from a high window. And so, what God had spoken through the prophet Elijah and the punishment that came upon Ahab and Jezebel, we see it happening. So just like they killed Naboth, uh, you know, King Ahab and Jezebel were also dead, okay? Um, so what's the use of Naboth's vineyard uh, to both of them now? Because they are not living. So you can narrate the story as uh, greed. Greed uh, destroys our life. It will not help us to enjoy uh, what we have, uh, or you can talk about the consequences of sin, how sin destroys our life, and that we cannot enjoy what we uh, want to in our sinful, uh, lustful desires or passions. Okay? Um, so that is the conclusion of the story. Now, once the conclusion of the story has happened, you can bring about the 
um, application. Now, uh, this is the part where we lack as um, as children's church ministers and as Sunday school teachers because we very beautifully narrate the whole story. Uh, we teach them. We use different, um, uh, uh, you know, pictures and exciting things uh, for the children to learn and make their experience a wonderful learning experience. But we don't get to the application. And that is where when children grow up, we see that they have failed to apply what they have learned at a very early age. So it's important to get them to apply the truth that they have learned daily in their lives. So what is the main what is the application? The application should always be along with the main truth of your lesson. Now, the main truth of this lesson might be, you know, greed. It can be about uh, consequences of sin. It can be about, um, uh, you know, um, how, um, you know, when we desire things that are uh, of somebody else and it's not ours uh, and we want to enjoy it, how we will not be able to. Uh, and God sees us in, you know, King Ahab and Jezebel, Queen Jezebel thought that they're king and queen. Uh, no one can do anything to them, but, you know, how God sees our sin. And when he sees our sin, you know, there is punishment because for every sin, there is consequences. We face the consequences for our sin. So if it's on those lines, you can talk about uh, the application. So what can be the application? You can say, children, what is the areas that you... Uh, are greedy about or you always want more and more when you see it with somebody else somebody else having it you want it constantly you know wanting more and more of the same thing so it can be different for different children so you can get them to write down what their greed is uh, then you can lead them uh, in a prayer you know uh, of uh, getting them to uh, of God helping them to overcome their greed or maybe it's sin or, you know, whatever is your main learning objective, you can get them. But don't keep the uh, application very general. For example, children, you should not be greedy. So you know what happens when we get greedy. Uh, you see how greed destroys our life. Uh, so let's pray and ask Jesus uh, to help us not to be greedy. Now, that's a good uh, one part of the application. But the other thing is, ask them which areas they are uh, you know, facing greed or um, problem of greed or uh, they want more and more or, uh, you know, I help them identify that they have greed in their life or this, they're struggling with uh, with greed or help them identify that, you know, the, uh, the areas where, uh, uh, you know, they are uh, uh, sinning against God or maybe, you know, uh, it can also be that, you know, you have been cheating in class and you think nobody has caught you and uh, so you continue cheating but remember that God is giving you a chance that just like Ahab was caught and, uh, you know, God pronounces a judgment, you will be caught one day, you will receive the punishment for your sin. So it's good now at this time to just confess your sin and ask God to forgive you. So they can write down the areas where they are sinning, you know, ask God and lead them in a prayer of uh, you know, confessing their sin and asking God to forgive them and helping them to live right. And also get them to practice in the week, you know, uh, whichever areas that they are, uh, you know, they they feel that uh, greed has overtaken or areas where they're sinning or they have been living in sin, you know, ask them to um, pray and ask God to help them to overcome that this week, this week not to do it, whether it's back answering their parents, disobeying, talking bad words or fighting with their friends, whatever, you know, ask God to help. And if they have done it, you know, they can quickly ask God for forgiveness and ask God to give them the strength not to do it again, okay? So that is an effective way of application where the children are learning to apply. So when once they move to adult church, you know, when they're listening to the sermons, they uh, immediately, you know, they are um, going to, uh, you know, learn to apply it in their own personal lives, okay? So that is the application. And after the application is you can teach them um, the memory verse and then close with uh, prayer. Now, there are different creative ways of teaching children uh, memory verses. You can look online. You will find a lot of uh, attention getters, object lessons, and 
different ways of teaching memory verse. So you can teach them the memory verse, then maybe write it on the board and then ask them to read it. And the second time when they read it, you know, delete one word. Uh, the third time they read it, delete another word. So, you know, basically uh, they keep repeating. And um, uh, when the board is clear, you would uh, notice that they would have just learned their memory verse. Or you can teach them the memory verse and have a small football and, you know, who, uh, just throw it to one child. And whoever the, the child uh, catches the ball, they have to say the memory verse and the child can throw it to somebody else. So they are learning playing as well as uh, learning the memory verse, okay? Or you can teach them memory verse with actions. For example, um, you know, uh, love. You can say, you know, love. You can put a heart, love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor. They can just put their hand on their neighbor, you know, as yourself. So even when you're doing actions, uh, they can um, they can learn. So when you want to know if they have really learned it, you keep doing the action and they just repeat it. So you just keep doing the action and, you know, the Lord, love, heart, whatever, uh, they keep doing the, uh, you keep doing the action and they're repeating the verse. So the different uh, ways that, um, you know, children can learn memory verse in a very creative, exciting way, it's... Uh, all available online you can um, get them to uh, you can just have a look at it and choose uh, different ways that you can um, you know get children to learn the memory verse okay and of course um, end your lesson with prayer okay Lead them in a prayer. Um, maybe you want children want you want to lead, give them an altar call. Uh, lead them in a salvation prayer. You can do this as well. So, you know, lead them in a time of prayer. So this is basically about how to write a lesson plan, how to narrate um, a narrative or story in the Bible, uh, and how to teach uh, a class uh, a lesson on a basic topic. Okay. So that's all about uh, children's ministry. Um, I hope um, the classes were helpful and beneficial for each one of you. I know some of you who are um, thinking of being pastors and evangelists, you really uh, might have felt it a little childish, but I'm sure you can use some of these in your uh, when you're preaching and teaching, especially object lessons, uh, they're good tools to get people to uh, learn uh, and also to remember concepts and simplify concepts. Okay. So we will um, have two tests um, or assessments. Uh, when would you like to have the two assessments? Can you give me a date, please? Can we have one on uh, March 14th and the other one on April 4th? Is that okay? Yes, uh, final assessment. And, uh, two assessments. Uh, one on March uh, 14th, which is uh, Monday, and the other one on uh, April 4th. Is that okay? Yes, no. Okay, ma'am. Okay. March 14th and uh, April 4th. This is fine, right? Anyone has any questions you'd like to ask? Any doubts? Any questions, any doubts? No? 
Okay, if there's no questions, no doubts, uh, we'll just end class here. Okay, thank you all for uh, joining the children's ministry class. And uh, from next week onwards, uh, Pastor Roshan will take your class. He will not be taking class tomorrow. Okay. Is that fine? Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you, ma'am. For all of you, for those of you who like to uh, or already in children's ministry, I hope this has helped and benefited you. Uh, if you want any more inputs, please feel free to ask and reach out. Um, and um, you know, I hope this is uh, will equip you better to minister to children in a more effective and in a more powerful way. Okay, God bless all of you and your ministries and what you're doing. Um, May the favor of God just rest upon each one of you. Thank you all for joining class. Thank you.